is only the introduction to a series of uh, seminars over the next several months to highlight the issues of understanding Singapore before raffles. And the first one will be, well, the basic question you put, we have accepted that we have a 200 year history and why was there nothing before that? So let me start. The question, the answer to the question I pose is very simple because our former Deputy Foreign Minister, uh, Prime Minister, long serving Foreign Minister, and Minister of Culture, S. Raja Ratnam, declared it so. And this is in 1984. And so I'll leave you to read this. You can read it faster than I can read it out verbally to you. And again, in 1987, he reiterated this. You note that the uh, wording here. Our past was a matter of supreme indifference. Never, I, the island never really had a history worth remembering. And uh, the history is a come down. Begins in 1819. Raffles landed in Swampy, Singapore with some 40 deaths, 50 unremarkable kampong huts and a sprinkling of very lost Chinese. All this is in Raja's very purple prose that he is well known for. So, he's right that this is not the stuff out of which enthralling history is made. So, how did Raja come to view that there is no Singapore before Raffles? And I then want to go on and the main part of this uh, presentation here in which I got no new evidence, uh, no new facts to present to you, only arguments and ideas is to go into the assumptions underlying Raja's views. Where did he get it from? And how is this view of Singapore's past changing? So that are the three issues I want to try to tackle in this uh, presentation here. The origins of this belief that Singapore was uninhabited before Raffles comes from Raffles himself. And you look at the date here. This is 8th of January, 1819, before he even got to Singapore, at the end of January there. He already wrote back from Penang to the Governor General that this is what he has found from every inquiry, fully satisfied of the value and importance of the island of Singapore, deserted for centuries, long before the Dutch power existed in these seas. There are about 2,000 inhabitants upon it, new settlers, under a respectable chief. So, there you got it from the man himself. And finally, Dr. John Crawford. He wrote this in his final big book, a dictionary of the Indian archipelago, in which he more or less summarized what he knew and the British knew of Singapore and the archipelago. So, look at the phrasing there. Single village of poor and predatory Malay fishermen form only in 1811, for a period of five centuries and a half, no record of it being occupied. Until it was taken possession of by the party, British, from whom we first received it, Mr. Domingo, and that he himself came there with 150 followers in the summer of 1811. Crawford should know what he's talking about. He was uh, one of those who not only witnessed history, but made it. He was the second resident of Singapore and had earlier visited the island in 1821. So, the conclusion is that very clearly is that both Raffles and Crawford were aware of an earlier settlement on Singapore from their study of Malay history. Raffles proclaimed it loudly that he and John Layden had translated the Malay annals and was aware that Singapore was the capital of an earlier Johor Sultanate, and you are both aware of Portuguese records, references to a settlement in the 14th century. Crawford, by the way, was the better scholar than Raffles. He knew sufficient Javanese and old Javanese to decipher that the script on the Singapore stone was old Javanese. So, we also know that Raffles arrived at the deserted and depopulated island 
both of them stated it so and we do not doubt that what they saw is accurate. So the conclusion is that this earlier settlement that they saw the remains of uh, was abandoned for a period of about five centuries and a half. And this date comes from Crawford, who is very accurate that he got it right that the earlier settlement declined when Malacca was founded. So here we have the template of Singapore history being formed. And the template is set. The British residents of Singapore took the 6th of February as the anniversary and held a ball on that date every year. And here you see an illustrated London News illustration of that ball. And this is reported on 22 April 1854. Look at the far end there. There's a bus there. That is Raffles. The Chantelier bus that the Lady Sophia Raffles donated to Singapore. And this picture has been much used. Look at the Asians, they're all dressed in their traditional uh, costumes, whereas the Westerners are all dressed up in their formal dress. When exactly this ball, the celebration on 6th of uh, February, stopped, I have not been able to ascertain. But this is here the template being of Singapore history being set. And finally, you have it being consolidated by none other or represented by none other than Sir Frank Swettenham, the uh, Governor General, High Commissioner, etc., etc., to the Strait Settlement and the Malay States, writing in his book British Malaya in 1906. And he went through several editions until after the war, 1955. And this is I'm quoting from Frank Swettenham in his 1955 edition to him. We owe the possession of Singapore, gateway of the further east, naval base of the highest importance. I think Swettenham was turning prayer to the naval base uh, at uh, Sumbawang there. Commercial centre, most prosperous of British crown colonies. Indirectly, the foresight which secured Singapore for the British Empire also led to the extension of British influence through the states of the Malay Peninsula. And Swettenham is here laying the ground for his own contribution, his claim to the making of uh, British Malaya. Swettenham was one of those who not only wrote about history, but not only wrote uh, made history, but lived long enough to write about it. And finally, this idea was taken up by none other than the Raffles Professor of History Kennedy Gordon Chagorning in 1969. This is in a volume commemorating the 150th anniversary of the arrival of uh, Raffles at Singapore. He edit, uh, edited by with his colleague Wee Jin B. And it's a, a famous quote that my colleague and I have used everywhere in all our publications. More than Singapore began in 1819. Nothing that occurred on this island prior to this had particular relevance to an understanding of the contemporary sea, only of antiquarian interest. What uh, Trigoning is saying here is that even if you can show me there were things happening on Singapore, irrelevant. It's only antiquarian. And I'll come back to this word antiquarian a bit later. And here, this view translated permeated down to the history department. History as taught at the University of Malaya, Singapore, National University of Singapore. I wonder how many audience can recognize this photo. I do, and if Tan Chin Tiong was here, he would. We were all taught by this group of people. Let me see if I can. You see Tregoning there, and over to his right, Constance Mary Turnbull, whom we will come Two. And to the extreme left, Professor Wong Lin Ken. And the extreme right is Sharum Ahmad, who went into a very distinguished career. That is the next head there, Edwin Lee. And they were kind, in, and this is Dr. Chang Haiding. And you include Mark Ibrahim, the office boy, was even there. So, 
the point to make here is that for Trigoning and all these people there, the history of Singapore is only what is contained in the Straits Settlement Factory records and the Colonial Office records. This is how they were taught history by their uh, teachers at the old Raffles College, the beginnings of the University of Malaya, people like Brian Harrison and Jeremy Cowan. If it's not there in the Straits Settlement and the Colonial Office, it is not history. And finally, the person who we'll often come back to and will have the last word in this presentation, Constance Mary Turnbull. She came to Singapore to join the Malayan Civil Service as a young undergraduate after World War II. And she served in the Malayan Civil Service until about, well, about several years, until 1955 or 56, when it became apparent that the whole thing was going to be closed because of impending independence of Malaya. And she then transferred to become an academic in the history department, where she went on to write a PhD thesis on Singapore, on as a member of the Straits Settlement. And in 1975, 77, she wrote what has become a definitive benchmark history of Singapore. So this is on the very first page of her book, More Than Singapore is Unique, and so on. Now, the key sentence is there, where she wrote, the great trading city of the Malay annuals, a myth, no corroboration of this, the unique geographical situation of Singapore, which has been a cause of Singapore's commercial success, not of comparable importance in ancient days, when the routes depended on the trade winds which carried ships to Sumatra, Tamasic, at most a small outpost of Sriwijaya. It's a point of view she maintains until the last edition of a book. So the template is set now. But this view of Singapore's history that Turnbull is espousing, there is a basic inherent contradiction and paradox. How can you, how could Raffles have written this in good faith to his boss, the Governor General, a British nation commanding the southern entrance of the Straits of Malacca? commanding extraordinary local advantage with a peculiarly admirable geographic position has been established by him, he didn't say it, on the ancient capital of King Johor. It begs the question, you mean the Dutch, the Portuguese, who were there 200 years before Raffles, were so ignorant, they were unaware of this peculiarly admirable geographic position? You mean generations of Malay sultans were also unaware of it? How do you explain this paradox? And here you see this map, the first uh, Dutch map by Lin Shouten, of how they conceive of this part of the world that they were entering in 1600. And finally, this paradox drawn on the next professor of history, Wong Lin Ken, in an introduction to, uh, I think it was a Nanyang Xiang Pao or Lian, uh, exhibition of historic photographs of Singapore in 1981. History of Singapore before 1819 cannot be separated from the territory and British of Sriwijaya, Machahe, Thailand, and the Malacca and Johor Sultanates. But no meaning here that Singapore should be part of them and figured in their history where there should be a port. That is the underlying statement of Wong Lin Ken's uh, point here. But no historian has yet adequately explained why Singapore failed to be a major trading center before the 19th century. Wong Lincoln went on to provide his own answer to that, which I will not go into here, but if there's interest, we can raise it at the question time. Note here the language. Sir Richard Winstead, the foremost British scholar of Malay language, literature, and history. Some 30 years or more, this is 1935. How was it that an island which Raffles found to be a mangrove swamp attracted attack from the Cholas, Machapahit, and Siam? And he argued and concluded as a colony, its fate was bounded up, bound up with that of the empires of Sriwijaya, Machapahit, and Siam. And he returned to this from 30 odd years later, 1964, to conclude but the logic that 
Singapore must have been colonized by a ruler of Palembang, Sriwijaya, probably around the 7th century current era. So that is Winston. He also realized the contradictions, the paradox of maintaining that Singapore is geographically strategically located, yet uninhabited and depopulated when Raffles arrived. So, the search for early Singapore. It must, there must have been something there in Singapore. It's just that, number one, the historians have not looked hard enough. Hmm. Or, B, Raffles got it wrong. It wasn't that strategic. So we start with Roland Bradle. His name still survives in the law firm that carries his name. Uh, this is him on a boat coming back from England. He started with the Greco-Roman text of the cartographer, geographer, Claudius Ptolemy. And the argument by the European scholars which Bradle followed and made much of is that here you have Ptolemy marking a golden peninsula, a Chris Kisonis. And at the tip of it all, there is marked a Saba, Sabara Emporium. And generations of geographers and historians have argued, is this Singapore? That there was therefore a settlement in Singapore from the second century Christian era when Ptolemy was supposed to have drawn this map. Today the answer is quite clearly no. From the other end, a group of Chinese scholars represented by Su Yinxiao, Tan Yok Xiong, who formed the South Sea Society looked at the classical Chinese records and histories for Singapore. Su Yan Xiao finally concluded that a 3rd century report by Kang Tai, the Chinese envoy, to, uh, to something in Chinese that can be translated into Malay as Pulau Ujong, the island at the end, must refer to Singapore. And in 1950, Paul Whitley arrived from Singapore, in Singapore, to take up the position, a position in the geography department, which, for those of you who know, the old campus was next door to the history department in the next block. And Paul Whitley was inspired substantially by Dr. Bradle and Su Yan Chiao to start learning classical Chinese, to look into, to study the historical geography of the Malay Peninsula. And in 1961, he published what remains a definitive benchmark reference text on the historical geography benchmark simply because in one volume is conveniently compiled in the original languages all the classical Chinese, Greek, Indian, Arabic texts on the Malay Peninsula. Basically, Whitley has reframed Singapore, Malay Peninsula's early history as one of an issue of historical geography of settlement and urbanism and topic that quickly went on to make a major name and reputation for himself after he left Singapore. And this idea that Singapore's history is best started as a problem of historical geography, there are no people, no events, must be geography, continued right down to 1991 when the history department published what was then supposed to be a textbook, a history of Singapore. The entire pre-1819 history is relegated by Ernest Chiu, the editor of the volume, to one chapter by his colleague, the geographer Arthur Lim Ju Jok, who talks about the geographical setting of early Singapore. And for Ernest Chiu, the issues of Singapore is whether it was Crawford or Raffles that founded Singapore and should be given the honour of that. So, the alternate research for Singapore continued in the old Raffles Museum, headed by this gentleman, Carl Alexander Gibson Hill, who studied the old charts, rutters, about sailing past Singapore, whether you sail past more on what is today the Thurbrow Strait between Johor and Singapore, or the Sentosa, Sing uh, Singapore, Capital Harbour Straits, or south of Sentosa. 
So Gibson Hill was able to make a very coherent case as to when in different eras these passages were used. Yeah. But for the historians, Trigoning and company at the history department, all this is irrelevant. And here is Trigoning reflecting in his memoirs in 1989. Malayan studies was of antiquarian interest only, preserved largely of expatriates such as Charles. And he couldn't even get the name right, Gibson Hill. The eccentric, lovable genius who ran the, sorry for the printing errors here, the Raffles Museum and edited the Journal of the Malayan Branch of the Royal Asiatic Society. He was in effect dismissing the entire work of the Jumbras, which published Bradle, Su Yen Chiao, and all the other people. But as one of my colleagues pointed out, this is understandable because Trigoning was promoting his own Journal of Southeast Asian History and had, therefore, to run down Jumbras. But here I get a pipe, I turn to this word, antiquarianism. This is the second time Trigoning used it. First in 1969 and then here in 89 again. Antiquarianism Trigoning using in a very precise sense of describing an approach to European history between the 15th and 19th century, which was done by amateurs and others who just simply randomly collected bits of Greco Roman or Greek and Roman stuff no relevance to the present and that is the key the relevance to the present because the work of gibson hill etc etc did not connect to tregoning and by and by association turnbull wong lincoln ernest chu and all the others of the british colonial past that led to their decolonizing present 1950s 1960s onwards leading and the post-colonial future that they were grappling with. And this Turnbull makes very clear in her book that is a contribution to helping to understand the new nation-state of Singapore in 1975. So by that criteria, then, you know, you have a post-colonial nation-state that emerged out of an anti-colonial, nationally struggling planet. Therefore, you must have a colonial past that engendered and created that anti-colonial struggle and all before the colonial past, out. So, what are we doing about that? Well, uh, in 1984, the old National Museum managed to get some funding support, policy support, to start the first archaeological excavation in Singapore, for which we, they invited John Mixick, who was then lecturing in archaeology at Gajah Mada University, to come and supervise that dig. It was against the odds that we would find anything on Fort Canning, but we had to try before the, I think it was the tourism board, had plans to go and uh, dig up the whole hill, you know. It's grossly underutilized as a park in the central area, and you need to hype up the area. So before that, the museum moved and got Mexic to do a preliminary dig. And lo and behold, we, he did manage to find an undisturbed 14th century stratum on that hill. And I think produced got about several kilogram of uh, shards to prove that. The picture you see here is of that dig which had the corner near the Kramat, which has now been redeveloped as a little site museum. I should add here that since then, from that few tens of kilos of shards, the last one at Empress Place produced about three tons. So now, somewhere sitting downstairs is about two or three tons of material that Lim Chen Sen has uh, recovered from his digs. Another approach to early Singapore is the problem of the Sejara Melayu, the Malay annuals, from which we all derive the name, the stories of how Singapore got its name. 
that this wandering prince from South Sumatra came and saw this creature which he was told was a lion and he took it to be an auspicious symbol that he should set up a new city here. Now obviously since lions don't exist in Singapore, it must be a myth. But it's still a nice story. So the Central Mayu has been seen as more mythos than history. Richard Winstead declared it so that nothing can be made of this hotspot of Chola, Malay and other folklore. And that's how we have the common view of the uh, Sejarah Malayu. But I think there's been a re-reading, there's a recognition that there must be a core of literary realism belief that. And the person who started this was Oliver Walters, another ex-Malayan civil service officer like Mary Turnbull, who took early retirement in 57, like her, and went on to do a PhD at SOAS, writing on Sri Vijayan history from the Chinese sources, simply because Walters was with the Chinese Secretariat and had a fluent command of Chinese and classical Chinese. And that has been his forte, reading the Chinese sources on early Southeast Asian history. Uh, I will not go into Walters here, except that he was suggesting a deeper meaning to it, which somewhere in August, our colleague here, former colleague Andre Arki, uh, will present a deeper reading. Basically, I think Andre will be arguing that given the theological, political ideology of the 14th century, we have to see in this Jalmayu a very deep Vajrayana Buddhist ideology. And I'll leave it at that. Yes, I want to move through and have more time for the discussion. Another approach we we're looking at, which my colleague, whom I've been working very closely with, Peter Boschberg, uh, he joined the department here in, I think, 1992, making him one of the oldest expatriates in the department now. He joined as an uh, expert on the Dutch legal scholar of the 16th century, Hugo Grotius, who made his name defending a Dutch action of freebooting piracy off the coast of Changi. And from there, Boschberg has had to look. So how did Grotius get involved in this? What was his source of information? And what was this action? And from there, he's had to move to looking at the whole field of Portuguese-Dutch rivalry in the 17th century. He has several books on this and I merely highlight one of them. We are hoping that uh, Boschberg will be speaking in this series of uh, seminars later to tell us more about what more and how to read the Portuguese and Dutch sources for a better understanding of that period of our history between the fall of Malacca and the arrival of Raffles. Next, we'll be looking at the framing of Malay history. What exactly is Malay history? Leonard Andaya will be speaking next week. He has made a reputation for himself studying the issue of Johor. And from there, he's widened his field to look at the whole issue of Malay history, leaves from the same tree. He will be, he has been invited to speak on the role of the Orang Lao. The issue here being that the Sejral Malayu, the Portuguese and the Dutch refer to these sea nomads, sea rovers, Orang Lao as we know them, as the servants, the naval might, the uh, <clears throat> keepers of the Sultan's uh, well-being. Yet, these Orang Lao when Raffles came across them, Crawford came across them, Munchi Abdullah, they were described by Munchi Abdullah as a group of dirty, marginalized nomads living on little sampans in the Singapore River and the Kalang River Basin, as these photographs indicate they are still doing. Could these people have been the warriors of the Malay Sultans? Well, Leonard Andar will explain that 
to us hopefully next week. Mike Flacker, I think he's sitting somewhere at the back there. I hope I got a good photo of you, Mike. I was about to put one of you in a diving suit, but it didn't look too good. So I hope this is a better photo of you. He has been invited to speak on the issue of the boats that the Johor and Malacca people were sailing. The Portuguese described these huge ocean-going junks. The Orang Lao obviously did not go waging war defending the Sultan in those little sampans that they lived on in the swamps. There must have been other boats, local boats. What are they? Where are they? So, Mike Flecker had been looking at this and we looked to him to tell us his latest research on what were these Malay ships sailing in the Straits of Malacca and Singapore. So, the conclusion I'm reaching is does these current approaches that I, that the friends, associates of the Nalanda Srivijaya uh, have been working on uh, lead to a new, to a connected history of Singapore? Connected in the sense that the first director, Sentar Sen, was working towards that these days we don't look, we look at history as how it connects us across time and space. So in that context, are we able now to connect Singapore's pre-1819 past with its post-1819 past and post-65 past, present? And does this connected history, are we able to connect history with the region and with others outside the region across space and time? from the 14th century until today. That has been the problem here of uh, Chagoning Turnbull. That you cannot trace any connected settlement, history of settlement on Singapore. Only after 1890 can you do so. So therefore, what was there before 1819 does not count. It's irrelevant because you can't connect it. It's, it's out there. So, I give the last word to Turnbull. This is in her new 2009 edition of, and she now said, History of Modern Singapore. And I think this bears very careful reading. She's dismissing everything that has been done. The findings of careful archaeological work carried out in the late 20th century, she's referring here to the work of John Nixick, the National Museum, myself included, together with a study of pre-colonial records, charts and maps, Gibson Hill and Company, myself, supplement, but basically support the previous known story, namely that Tomasic appeared flourished for a few decades as one of a number of moderately prosperous ports in the region, but came to a sudden, violent and mysterious end at the close of the 14th century. And after that, after that for nothing of significance took place on the island until Raffles' party landed in 1819. So, the template holds. Can the work at the Nalanda Sri Jaya change that? That is the issue now. The issue here simply is that, you know, what Turnbull, as I said, if you are looking for continuous settlement, no. We cannot, we don't have that links. So, if that is what we are looking for, is the history of Singapore as a nation state, as a city state, continuous settlement before that, then Turnbull is absolutely right, Chagorni absolutely right right up pre-1819. But, can we do that? That period, that interpretation of Singapore's history has served us well. Has helped us to understand the period from 45 to 65 to today. But, as a nation state, coming out of a British colonial past, but I think here, the issue is that as Singapore moves, and here I'm going beyond the limit of this uh, 
seminar topic here, as Singapore moves to becoming, aspiring to become a global city after 1989. Is this story, this narrative, still valid? And if not, where do we start the history of Singapore as a global city? Arguably, you could say it's the British again, raffled that it was the beginning of the modern era. But we are arguing here, I think, that there's more to it. And on that note, I think I've taken about uh, just 40 minutes. Uh, let me stop here. Okay, thank you.